Welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us today on the journey towards self mastery. Our next guest is one of the leading experts on reparations in the country. He's an economist, a social science researcher, and a professor of African studies and economics at Duke University. He has published more than 250 articles dealing with race, discrimination, reparations, and more. He served as the chair of the Department of African Studies and was the founding director of the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Inequality at Duke University. He's author of the book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. Let's welcome today, Dr. William A. Darity to the program. Dr. Darity, how are you doing today? Thank you for having me on, Mr. G. I'm glad to join you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, the pleasure is all ours, man. Um, I've actually been following your work for a little while. A friend of mine, uh, Mr. Christopher Everett, had you on his documentary. And I, from then on, I'm like, I got filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wilmington on fire on the Wilmington, Wilmington Massacre. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sure. sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So from seeing that, you know, I, I knew I had to get you on, man. Shout out to Mr. Christopher Everett. We'll have him back on the program at some point as well. He's working on some good stuff. Um, but yeah, man, I knew, you know, from your research and your expertise, I had to have you on because this is like a critical topic that everybody's talking about right now. And, you know, you've been doing the, the work and the research for quite a bit. So I think you're the guy to talk to about this. Um, but before we get into the reparations talk, I just want people to get an idea kind of who you are and how you got into this work and things like that. And even your own experience. I know you grew up in the, um, you know, the Jim Crow era yourself, man. So if you could, Talk to us about, you know, growing up and how you got to where you are right now. Yeah. When the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, I was 11 years old. So the first 11 years of my life was the period under which there was uh, legal segregation in the South. My recollections are uh, not so much associated with the violence that took place in that period, as my personal experiences sharing marches with my mother. And there was at least one march in which we did feel threatened, but fortunately we were not directly attacked. But there also um, was a, a wave of indignities that we were continuously subjected to. And I remember my parents refusing to let me go see a Disney movie that I wanted to see very badly because uh, it was only being shown in the white theater in the town where we were located. And I would have had to have sit and sat in the balcony. And, uh, and my parents uh, refused to do that. Mm. So they would never go to a movie theater where they had to sit in the balcony and they would only go to black owned movie theaters in, and so they would forego seeing any of the films that might be shown in the white movie theater. But it, it gave me a, an early sense of principle and uh, the fact that there are circumstances in which when you do the right thing, you might have to make sacrifices. And I mean, mm -hmm. not seeing a movie is not a major sacrifice, but it is a, a microaggression of sorts. So I, I remember that period very, very, very clearly. Uh, I also remember the exuberance that people felt at the point where the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. But I also re realized, you know, realized fairly quickly, you know, by the time I was a college student and I began college in 1970 or so, that <clears throat> it appeared that the civil rights revolution was not sufficient. Hmm. And that, in fact, there were dimensions of the civil rights revolution that masked serious inequalities that were persisting in the United States between blacks and whites. And so, so I, th I think that's, you know, when I got onto the path of really thinking about these kinds of issues very seriously, I, I was concerned about what we really needed to do to alter the landscape with respect to economic inequality mm -hmm. between blacks and whites in the United States. Mm. And so for many years, I, I, 
was was working about on and thinking about a host of social policies that might be uh, of significant help in changing circumstances. Uh, but it wasn't until 1989 or so uh, when an economist named Richard America handed me an edited manuscript that he had put together, and he subsequently called it The Wealth of Races. And this was a manuscript that consisted of a set of articles by economists who were attempting to estimate the magnitude of a reparations bill. And at the time, I was a reparations skeptic. My perspective was that this was the right thing to do, but that it was never going to happen. And and I, I hear people say this now, you know, that yep. this is a, a crazy idea because it's never going to happen. You know, so what, that, what that persuaded the United you? States government will never do this. <laughs> uh, but uh, I started reading the essays because Richard wanted me to write an introduction to his volume. And, and he told me I could say whatever I wanted. If I mm -hmm. wanted to say that this was a crazy idea and that these essays were of no value, I could say that. If I wanted to say something else, I could say that. So I had full discretion. Right. And so I started reading the essays. And the more that I read, the more I became convinced that this was so much the right thing to do that even if the odds were extremely long, it was something that I should be engaged in, both from the standpoint of advocacy, but also from the standpoint of doing the research work to try to craft a plan that might be an effective one for implementing reparations. Right. And, you know, I now say when people bring up this question of whether this is something that's likely to occur, I now frequently say that if you went back to 1817 in the United States, you probably would think slavery would never come to an end. But would that mean that you shouldn't fight to bring it to an end? Great and point. similarly, point. if you think the odds are long today about actually having a reparations plan, but it's the only real way to address fundamental economic inequalities in the United States, hmm. then shouldn't you go ahead and fight for it? Great points. I definitely want to get into uh, the idea of reparations and everything. Before we get into that, I kind of want to know what, made you interested in this work in the first place outside of, you know, reading those publications and um, what made you interested in black studies and focusing in on the history yeah, of black people? Made me interested in, in uh, black studies and focusing on the history of black people and, um, you know, teaching, being a professor, all that stuff. What, what brought you into that lane before, you know, you got into the whole reparations? I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if I can pinpoint when I, you know, sort of became somebody who was embracing black studies as an important uh, field of inquiry. I know that, you know, I came from a family where there was a tremendous focus on the injustices that were in associated with race, uh, but also injustices in general. I mean, I, my parents, my, my father, for example, and I, I don't know if everyone in the audience will fully appreciate this, but my, my father campaigned for Henry Wallace in North Carolina in 1948, Henry Wallace had been uh, Franklin Roosevelt's vice president, mm. and he was significantly to the left of Roosevelt. And uh, my father was a student at Shaw University. And uh, when the president of the institution found out that my father was campaigning for Henry Wallace, he threatened to throw him out of school. Uh, that didn't ultimately ultimately happen, and and my father didn't stop campaigning for Henry Wallace. But you know, I come from a family where there has been this deep commitment to trying to address issues of social injustice, and I've been particularly concerned because of the fact that I am a, a native Black American about uh, the injustices that have been inflicted on Black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. So. I, I don't know. That's been a, something that's been, you know, part of the fabric of my life for a long, long time. So I, I can't really pinpoint a moment where that did not animate my life as a, as a very important concern. I, I will say that when I was an undergraduate at Brown, I began to recognize that there was a whole tradition of thought that argued that the sources of the inequalities that black people experience in the United States is their own behavior. Mm. That is to say, 
black people are dysfunctional and so they produce the inequalities that they're experiencing. And I knew that I immediately rejected that point of view. Mm -hmm. And so I made a, an, a commitment fairly early on uh, to set as one of my important priorities in, in academic life, uh, challenging those kinds of arguments. Mm. Got you. All right. So reparations, I think, is, is an extensive case when we're looking at the history of slavery. We're looking at civil rights era. We're looking at the Jim Crow era. We're, we're looking at racism in America and all these things. How did you go about doing the research um, required to even bring a case and argument to you understanding that this is something that is worthy of fighting for reparations? Well, I think as early as the point at which Richard America asked me to read those essays on estimating the cost of a reparations plan and in the process of preparing the introduction for his book, The Wealth of Races, <clears throat> I think that's the starting point for my deep engagement in uh, the, the conversation, both the intellectual conversation and then ultimately the national conversation about reparations. Around 2003 or so, I published a paper with uh, Dania Frank Francis, who is an economist who's now at the University of Massachusetts at Boston. And we published a paper in the American Economic Association's Proceedings that was called The Economics of Reparations. And actually, I think it was the second significant paper ever published by economists on the subject of black reparations. Uh, the first was a paper that was published around 1974-75 in the same proceedings volumes by an economist named uh, Robert Brown. Mm. And in that particular essay, in consultation with Kirsten Mullen, who has been my co-author on From Here to Equality, we came up with some criteria to determine who would be eligible for reparations as African Americans. And so it's in that paper in 2003 that we lay out two criteria. The first is um, an individual would have to meet what we're now calling a lineage standard. They'd have to demonstrate that they had at least one ancestor who was uh, enslaved in the United States. And so I just heard a podcast with Jared Ball where he was saying, well, he has a, a white Jewish mother. And so would he get some deduction in his reparations? And <laughs> no, that's not our idea. If you can establish that you have at least one parent who has an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States, then that's sufficient. Mm. And we're not going to count fractions, and we're not going to do DNA testing. That's not the <laughs> idea. This is a genealogical project. And then, but there's a second condition that we talked about in that paper, which is what we now refer to as an identity standard. And so for at least 10 years before the adoption of a reparations plan or adoption of a study commission for reparations, an individual would have had to have self-identified on an official document as Black, Negro, African-American, or Afro-American. In more recent work, Kirsten Mullen and I have increased the time period to, to 12 years uh, because that would correspond to two senatorial terms. But it may have to be extended further to the extent that there may be people who are not living as Black who are recognizing that the prospect of a reparations plan might benefit them if they could establish that they met the lineage standard. And right. of course, I think there's a significant number of people out there who could meet the lineage standard, but they're living as white. And uh, I certainly don't think that they, they warrant reparations. <laughs> what do you, what about, what do you say to those that are like, all right, I might not meet the lineage standard, uh, Dr. Darity, but I have ancestors here from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s that have experienced a great deal of racial trauma. Maybe they've experienced things like uh, Wilmington, you know, in towns where they had to evacuate or racial issues that had to do with money, finances or whatever it is. So 
why am I excluded from this? And why does it just happen to be all the way back from then when my family experienced some of these same things? So, so the first thing I'll say to that is that there aren't very many people who would fit into that, that point of intersection. Mm. I think that the, uh, the best evidence that we have available suggests that uh, it's somewhere less than 1% of black Americans uh, who were present in the United States who were not descendants of persons enslaved here prior to the 1960s. Mm. So prior to the civil rights legislation, there wasn't a significant number of black people living in the United States who were not anchored in uh, the history of enslavement in this country. And I would say that the folks who were here uh, were concentrated almost exclusively in New York City and Miami, Florida. Mm. So, so that's the first point that they're, mm -hmm. you know, we're really not talking about a large number of people. But then the second point that I think is more critical is that the fundamental moment that created the debt that is owed to black American descendants of U.S. slavery is the failure of the federal government to provide 40 acre land grants, which were promised to the freedmen. Uh, so it's the descendants of freedmen who are owed a debt that has never been paid. Right, you're talking and about 40 acres. to that talk, community of individuals. Right, you're Third talking about 40 I'd acres and a mule, right? Perhaps right. the uglier one, Can you which is the ancestors of the freedmen were brought here in chains. Right, right. They were not voluntary migrants to the United States. But mm -hmm. if we start talking about other communities of blacks in the United States, uh, they or their ancestors made a decision to come here. And they made a decision to come here despite whatever conditions of racism existed here. Under those circumstances, it's not at all clear to me that they warrant reparations from the United States government. Now, I would certainly think that virtually all of those communities warrant reparations from the governments that enslaved or colonized their countries of origin. And I would enthusiastically support them in their efforts to make those claims. Mm. Uh, but I think that there's a dilution effect associated with appending their concerns to the claim that is held by black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Understood. Understood. All right. We, we did not really uh, define reparations yet. And I really wanted to get a fundamental understanding of what your understanding of it is, because I think a lot of us have different definitions of what we determine reparations to be. So what is your definition of reparations? And then what is the purpose of it? So the definition of reparations that we use, and this is a general definition, it's not necessarily specific to the black American or African American case, but the general definition that we use is reparations is a program of acknowledgement, redress and closure for a grievous injustice. The acknowledgement point of the reparations program is uh, that the culpable party must make an apology. It must acknowledge its responsibility for the atrocities that are relevant to this particular case. And it must make a commitment to undertake some form of restitution for the harms that have been inc incurred. So that leads to the second component of the definition, which is redress. Uh, which is the act of restitution. And this could be, well, it typically is for communities that have been victimized on the basis of race or ethnicity. And, and this is from an international perspective, typically is some form of a monetary payment. And, you know, the obvious examples are the German government paying uh, restitution to the victims of the Holocaust who were overwhelmingly Jewish, not exclusively, but overwhelmingly Jewish and then the United States government paying restitution to Japanese Americans who were subjected to mass incarceration in the United States during World War II. Mm. If we're trying to extrapolate from those examples, then it would suggest that there should be some type of monetary payment that's made to black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. And then the third component is what we refer to as closure. And so uh, I think some people misinterpret what we're saying here. When we talk about closure, we talk about a situation in which the account is settled and that the 
group that's been subjected to the harm or the victimization will not make any further claims on the culpable party for restitution unless, and this is critical, unless there is a renewal of the atrocities or there is a continuation of atrocities or there are new atrocities that take place. So, so the closure condition is what some people refer to as non-repetition. Folks, folks have said, well, you know, if you, if you establish that condition, then it means that, you know, folks can't protest any other harms, et cetera. No, not, a, not at all. Closure is conditional on there being no continuation of the harms. And mm. so that's, that's the third component of, of a reparations plan. Got you, got you. All right, so as far as, you know, your case for reparations based on how you define it and everything, what do you say to those that are like, well, when we look at the structure of this country and institutions and stuff like that, if you give in money to black people, how do they maintain that money and use it in a way that's going to be restorative, right? How is, you know, a lot of people say if they get that money, you know, it's the way things are functioning right now, it's going to go back into the white communities and, and, um, won't well, be able to build. So, so first of all, yeah, I mean, we, what you're talking about is what I call the Chappelle effect. I mean, there was a sketch that uh -huh. Dave Chappelle did where black people got reparations and all the money went back to white I people because <laughs> everything they had to buy was something that they would have to purchase from white people. Okay. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the, the, but the, but the first point is that, well, okay. So what exactly is it that folks have purchased and does it make their lives significantly better? That's the first thing. You know, maybe folks are thinking, well, folks are just going to spend their money frivolously, which is uh, a paternalistic judgment. But we don't have uh, a history of people receiving new sums of money, spending it frivolously at all. Uh, I mean, if we look at even even the case of lottery winners, it's kind of an urban myth that they waste all their money. In fact, the primary thing most lottery winners do is they set up... Uh, accounts, trust accounts for their for their children and grandchildren. Mm. Now, it may be the children and grandchildren do stupid things with the money, right. but the lottery recipients themselves do not. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really an urban myth that they they do they do crazy things with money. And then we, we've got instances where some communities have set up these guaranteed income schemes where they provide some monthly payments to uh, to families that have very low incomes. And what we find is that uh, when the folks receive those monies, they pay off their debts, they meet their utility bills in a way that they couldn't successfully beforehand, et cetera. So there's no, no real evidence that people just, uh, you know, go hog wild with these funds. So insofar as that's the case, we have to really pay close attention to what people actually do spend the money on. So even if it does flow back into white hands, are they spending money that would improve their own situation? And uh, the evidence is that they, they probably are. But then also, if you were to increase the, the level of, of net worth in the average black household by upwards of $1 million, which is what we have in mind in terms of the calculation that we've done for what an appropriate reparations program should be, mm -hmm. it would really alter their capacity to engage in, in their own business development. So that if, you know, if people are concerned that there's an inadequate infrastructure of black businesses, a reparations plan would create an opportunity to expand that infrastructure in significant ways. And so, and there's there's a tremendous amount of entrepreneurial spirit in the black community, mm -hmm. but there are not resources that permit people to either start up their businesses or sustain them, particularly if there's an economic downturn like the Great Recession or the economic downturn that was associated with the pandemic. And so, this additional set of resources from a reparations plan are is is a game changer, right? And I, I think I worry less about this notion of the money going back to whites than I, I think about the benefits that are associated with giving black people opportunities to to build their own businesses, to perhaps purchase homes, which 
They may be buying from somebody who's a white owner at now at the, at the present moment. The opportunity to have their sons and daughters go through college without coming out with any significant student loan debt. I mean, there's there's so many possibilities associated with changing the resource base in the black community in a significant way that uh, I think uh, that this worry that uh, the money will all be lost mm -hmm. is, is not valid. Uh, the money will be spent eventually. Right. But we have to pay close attention to how people spend the money. And there's no evidence that they wouldn't do things that would sustain or improve uh, their long-term economic security and uh, the opportunities that they provide to their children and their grandchildren. Great points. Great points. Um, so uh, in your book, Doc, Dr. Darity, you uh, talked about um, that Jewish people um, from Germany were able to get reparations here in this country. Uh, you talked about victims of Rosewood, Tulsa, and then the Japanese were able to get reparations. So, well, just for the some Tulsa context, victims actually have not gotten reparations. They the have Rosewood not, okay. victims have. Rosewood, and okay. then there's uh, a group of victims who we neglected to mention in the first edition of the book, and we we point this out in the preface to the second edition, but we didn't mention the victims of the Tuskegee experiments who did receive some form of uh, reparative payments much, much later. Just for uh, some, just for but, some. Yeah, but there's a, there's a number of instances in which reparations have been paid. No reparations have ever been paid collectively to black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Right. And uh, Dr. Darity, just for some context, uh, with those incidents, what do you remember what exactly those payments were? Like um, when we're looking at the Japanese, what, what did they do? So I do know what the amount was for Japanese Americans. In, in 1988, it was about $20,000. Mm. That is probably a number that was too low, but there was never any significant conversation about how to determine the amount. And, and that's been one of the tasks that, that Kirsten uh, and I have tried to undertake is, is to justify or create a rationale for a particular sum of money. But there was nothing like that done. So it was an arbitrarily chosen figure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it may be too low. But interestingly enough, it's the sum that went to every member of a family who was subjected to incarceration. So if you had a family of four or five people at the time, if they all were, if they all could come forward and make the claim, then you're talking about the family collectively having 80000 to to $100,000 more. And if you were to try to convert that into $2023, then we're talking about sums that are at least twice as much. Got it. So, um, Dr. Darity, people might be listening in and those that might be in favor or against reparations, they're like, maybe, how do you even know where to begin? We're talking about looking and crunching the numbers of slavery, segregation, sharecropping, um, the Civil War, um, convict leasing. These are all things you mentioned in your book, by the way, the construction of highways in black neighborhoods, yeah. um, redlining, housing segregation the destruction of black communities, racism, like there's a litany of things to look at. How do you even begin to crunch the numbers? And for those that say like, well, these numbers can't be accurate because how do you, how do, how would we even know how much money is, you know, in place for victims of these things? If, you yeah, know, I mean, that, that is one of the issues. I mean, one approach that you've just described is to, to, to identify all of the atrocities assign a numerical monetary value to each one and then add it up. Mm -hmm. And one of the difficulties is, of course, that we don't have sufficient data to do an accurate accounting for all of these atrocities. And uh, if you think about the 100 massacres that took place from the end of the Civil War to the beginning of World War II that were conducted by white terrorists, they seized and appropriated significant amounts of of black property, and they also killed large numbers of black people. And uh, we don't have an accurate count on the number of people who were killed, and we don't have an accurate count on the value of the property that was taken. 
in all instances. I mean, sporadically, we have some numbers like Tulsa, Oklahoma. We have insurance claims that were made but never met uh, by the insurance companies that were issued by black victims of the, uh, of the massacre there. Uh, so we can construct an estimate that's based on that information, but we mm -hmm. don't have similar information for 90 of the other massacres that took place. So, uh, so just from an, a, an informational standpoint, it's really difficult to pursue that route. And so we've argued that a more direct way to try to come up with an accurate estimate is to look at the economic consequences of all of those atrocities. And the economic consequences of those atrocities are captured, well captured by the racial wealth gap in the United States. Mm. And so we think that that's a summary measure that encompasses all of the harms that we've talked about in terms of their economic manifestations. Now, you know, people may say, well, there's psychological manifestations, trauma effects, et cetera. Can't speak to that by using this approach. But, uh, but we can say that at minimum, mm -hmm. a reparations plan should eliminate the racial wealth gap. And that's mm -hmm. how we come up with this estimate uh, that says that uh, the average black household has about $840,000 less in net worth than the average white household. Uh, this comes to about $350,000 per person. If you uh, multiply that across 40 million or so black Americans who should be eligible to receive reparations, then we're talking about a 14 to $15 trillion figure, 14 mm -hmm. to $15 trillion. Yeah. And so that's how, that's how we came at it by, by focusing on the racial wealth gap. And part of the racial wealth gap that you mentioned in your book um, for every black, um, for every black families, 10 cents, it's a dollar to the white families. So um, how like, people might think like, how can you make up for all of that in one, you know, set of reparations and, and not only make up for all that, but you're, you're, you're looking at a small percentage of black people that would qualify for that. So how much would that really have an influence on the racial wealth gap? So it's, it's not a small percentage of black people who would qualify it for it. It's about 90% of the black population in the United States today. Remember I said, uh, Prior to the 1960s, less than 1% of the black population consisted of individuals who did not have ancestors who were enslaved here. Mm -hmm. Today, it's closer to 10%. But that means that 90% of the black population in the United States would be eligible for, for reparations. So that's about 40 million people. So that's not a small number of people. Okay. Uh, but essentially, you know, by addressing the disparity that exists for black American descendants of U.S. slavery, you eliminate the disparity, any significant disparity that might might exist between all black people and all white people in the United States. And, and I will note that the net worth position of blacks who are more recent immigrants to the United States is higher than the net worth position of black Americans whose ancestors uh, were enslaved here. Hmm. Speaking of that, um, I myself am, am a recent immigrant of the United States and I come from Haiti. Um, so what advice do you give to those? You know, we, we have our own history in Haiti with dealing with the French and um, our battle for reparations. So what advice do you have for those that are looking at the work that you're doing and also want reparations in the places that they're in? Yeah, I, I mean, Haiti has such a... a <laughs> such a compelling case <laughs> for right. reparations. I mean, it's, it's beyond outrageous. Uh, I mean, the, the, perhaps one of the most striking things, and, and, and I know you're aware of this, is that circa 1825, the, the French compelled Haiti to pay them reparations. Yes, sir. <laughs> which is like outrageous. <laughs> so so there, there's a set of questions that, that are the same questions that we have. How do you want to receive reparations? Should this be something that is a state-to-state -state payment from France to the Haitian government? Or should there be some mechanism where there are direct deliveries of payments to individual Haitian citizens? How do you account for folks like you who are living overseas now? Uh, I mean, I think you should be part of that, that type of a claim. And also, 
uh, how do you determine what the amount is that's appropriate? Now, in a couple of commentaries that Kirsten and I have written, we've said that that France should return the uh, the reparations payments that they extracted from Haiti with interest. Mm. And then on top of that, there needs to be some compensation for the entire historical consequences of what took place not only during the period of enslavement, but after enslavement. Uh, because I think Haiti has been you know, the country that's been subjected to deep levels of animosity from the colonial powers. And it's primarily because Haiti was the first place to get rid of slavery. That's my feeling, that Haiti has a case for reparations. Uh, the various countries that are the English-speaking countries of the West Indies have a case for reparations against the United Kingdom. You know, a, a, a country like uh, the Congo has a huge claim on Belgium. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that in, in those cases, each of these countries should make their claim and pursue it. I, I believe CARICOM is pursuing claims on behalf of the English-speaking Caribbean countries. They may be including a claim for Haiti from France, but I'm not certain about that. But yeah, I, I think that there's there across the, the black diaspora or the African diaspora, there's a host of potential claims for reparations. Uh, but I think that the, uh, the black American claim is, is unique to the United States. Now, I will say this, interestingly enough, because of Haiti's history of being colonized during part of the time by the United States, Haiti may also have a claim on the United States. Mm, mm. That's an interesting thing to think about right there. Um, so, Dr. Darity, some, some people obviously are going to disagree with your claim for reparations. And I've heard you know, some white folks say, well, you guys are talking about reparations, but what, wasn't it African countries that gave away the slaves to white folks? Don't they play a hand in this? All right. Um, so what do you say about that part? And then the next part um, where I hear white people say, well, this is 2023. Um, you know, I didn't enslave any black people. Why am I paying taxes for this? Why am I paying for something that was done so long ago? Don't we already have affirmative action? Dr. Darity, like, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh I, I would love to invite folks to look at the 12th chapter of our book where we talk about all of these kinds of reflexive objections to reparations in some detail. But, yeah, it, it, first of all, it didn't happen that long ago, if you think about it from a generational perspective. In fact, uh, one example that we highlight in our book is the case of uh, uh, of the woman who was the first known black faculty member at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Ms. Hortense McClinton, who is now 104 years of age. Her father was born into slavery in January 1865 in Texas. Mm. So she is the first generation in her family out of slavery, and she's still living. Mm. Now, that's an unusual case, but on Kirsten Mullen's mother's side, she is only the third generation out of slavery. Her grandmother's father was born into slavery, and her grandmother was alive for most of Kirsten's life. It wasn't that long ago is not entirely accurate. But what's more important is that the effects of it persist. Mm -hmm. And they persist as a consequence of policies that were pursued by the federal government in the aftermath of slavery. One of those policies that I've mentioned is the failure to provide the formerly enslaved with the 40 acre land grants. So that, that creates the foundation for the racial wealth gap because at the same time, the federal government was giving one and a half million white families upwards of 10 to 15 percent of all whites in the United States land grants in the Western territories that consisted of 160 acre land grants mm. under the Homestead Act of 1862. Mm. So, um, so it's, it's not just slavery itself. That's the issue. It's also what happened after slavery ended that compounded 
the kinds of disparities that we're observing today and resulted in the kinds of harms and disadvantages that are incurred by living descendants of the persons who were enslaved. Now, there was another part of your question, and, and I rambled on so much that I've lost it. The first, the first part of the question that you asked. No, you, you've given us great information, Dr. Darren. Appreciate it. The next part was, uh, you know, well, you know, how, why, why would I want to be paying taxes for this thing where there are already yeah. things like affirmative action? There are already things like welfare out there for black people. Like, why, why, why do we need more of this? Yeah. So again, that's that's why I said I'd, I'd love people to take an opportunity to look at the 12th chapter of our book. We talk about why affirmative action is not reparations. We also talk about why uh, social programs of the type that uh, provide welfare payments and the like are not reparations. And in fact, we also make the point that there was a period of at least 30 years where blacks did not benefit from those types of social supports. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of the way in which the New Deal legislation was written to exclude domestic laborers and to exclude farm workers. And that was at a point where a very large percentage of black workers either held, held either one of those positions or the other. So there was a, at least three decades in which black folks didn't benefit from those programs at all, that they were exclusively uh, income supports that went to white Americans. But uh, compensation for uh, or offsets for low income is not the same thing as compensation for white supremacy. Because mm, uh, these, these low income support programs are for all Americans. They're not specifically for black Americans. And uh, they are not designed to address the racial wealth gap, which is, is, is critical to our, our line of thinking. Mm. Uh, affirmative action can perhaps boost incomes, but it doesn't have much of an effect on wealth. And it's really an anti-discrimination measure. It's, it's a measure that's put into place to try to stop discriminatory practices. It doesn't compensate people for the discrimination that they've been subjected to. Mm -hmm. you know, affirmative action is not, is not an act of reparation. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a step towards stopping a serious harm. Got it. Uh, Got but it. stopping a harm is not the same thing as providing restitution for the effects of those harms. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Um, so in your in the TED talk that you did, Dr. Darity, you talked about uh, your idea and your plans for, you know, uh, closing the wealth gap and how possible reparations might look like. So for those that are wondering about these numbers and the math and, you know, from that standpoint, uh, what are some of your ideas and how to distribute these payments and how to, to minimize these wealth gaps that exist? So in, in the work that, that we've done, we've argued that the, um, there should be, the priority should be given to direct payments to eligible recipients, just as restitution has been conducted in that manner for other communities that have been victimized in a collective way. We give pride of place to direct payments. Also, you know, you, you mentioned something that I didn't really talk about, but it's related, which is the question of how do you finance this type of project? And, uh, you know, people frequently are saying, well, they, they don't, they shouldn't be taxed uh, for something that they didn't do. And so, you know, one of our responses is that you probably can do this program without having any significant increase in taxes. Mm. So it would not necessarily be a question of taking dollars out of a white pocket and putting dollars into a black pocket. It would be the federal government that would be responsible for funding this, and the federal government has funded many significant projects without having any major increase or change in taxes. Uh, and, and the two examples that I would like to highlight that are recent is the federal government's monies that were assembled and spent in response to the Great Recession and the federal government's monies that were assembled and spent in response to the COVID-19 crisis. The, the danger with spending without taxing is that you can produce significant inflation. Mm -hmm. And so you have to design a new expenditure program of that type in such a way that you minimize the inflation risk. 
And we talk about that in chapter 13 of the book, where we suggest two things. One, uh, that the payments could be spread out across several years to reduce the boost in expenditure that might occur in any single year. We say it shouldn't be spread out longer than a decade, but if you did it across a decade, then you're essentially talking about $1.4 trillion per annum being distributed. Mm -hmm. And that has a different set of implications from $14 trillion being spent at one time. Mm. Uh, and then the other thing that we recommend is the possibility of distributing the funds in some form other than strictly an outright cash transfer. You could provide the funds in some sort of uh, asset that was less liquid so that people wouldn't necessarily have the capacity to spend it all at once. Uh, and this could include having the funds take the form of an annuity or a trust account or some type of an endowment. Uh, but the key point is ultimately the individual recipient should have full discretion over the use of the funds, even if they may not be able to spend the funds right away. Mm. Great points. Um, so what do you say, Dr. Darity, to those that are like, well, this sounds good. I'm sure it's going to help. But when we're dealing with white, white supremacy, when we're dealing with racism, you know, they're just going to figure out new ways. You know, they're going to inflate that money. You know, they're going to um, they're going to create different things that will create a larger wealth gap or whatever it is. So is it really tackling racism itself or are we just trying to put a Band-Aid on this? So I don't think we've ever argued that um, a reparations plan would eliminate racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We think that the degree of racism would have to be lower for a reparations plan to be adopted by the United States Congress uh, because we think that's the only way to do it. We, we, we don't think that this is something that can be accomplished through the court system. Uh, even if the courts declared that reparations was uh, was justified, uh, they don't have any capacity to implement a reparations program or provide the funding for it or anything like that. So really, it's congressional action that's, mm. that's, that's the key. And uh, do we have any grounds for optimism about that? Well, I think we do have some evidence that could give us a sense of uh, – uh, of hope about this actually occurring, although I'm not going to say it's necessarily going to occur in my lifetime. <laughs> but one of the most encouraging signals is the fact that in the year 2000, about 4% of white Americans endorsed uh, monetary payments as reparations for black Americans. That's F O U R. Okay, mm -hmm. so 96% <laughs> were opposed. Mm hmm. Uh, today, the percentage that's in support is closer to 30. And so that holds out the possibility of building or sustaining momentum for a movement to produce a comprehensive national program of reparations. Will we take advantage of that change? Uh, I hope that we do. But, uh, you know, it, 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 it remains to be seen. Got it. Got it. Um, what, do, what is your take on groups like the ADOS, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates himself talking about it, um, and then some of the colleges, some of the colleges that have gained from slavery, they give doing, you know, some might regard as minor things where they offer free scholarships to people that, that have been um, affected uh, by, by the damage that they've done. Uh, so what is your take to some of the minor things that are being done right now and some of the people that are fighting for reparations outside of yourself? Well, I, if, if I understand the ADOS movement correctly, there are two premises that I, uh, I, I'm quite, I mean, my perspective is quite consistent with. One is the premise that um, black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States do have a distinct cultural history. And uh, so as part of the diaspora, just as folks who are Jamaican have a particular Jamaican history, we have a history that is tied to uh, the United States. 
And uh, so, so if that's one of the premises of the Eidos movement, then I accept that. And then uh, if, if a second premise is that black reparations in the United States should be for individuals who are descendants of the freedmen, then I accept that also. There are some prop proponents of, of the Eidos movement who have some positions that I don't share. Uh, particularly uh, the, the, those who have a really, really uh, hostile outlook about immigrants. Uh, it's not something I share, but, mm -hmm. uh, but those first two premises are, are, are quite consistent with, with, with my point of view. So if, if we're talking about you know, the, the movement writ large, I think that uh, colleges and universities that have a history of complicity, and usually their focus is on complicity with slavery, mm -hmm. not necessarily their complicity with the Confederacy, which, you know, is an issue that ought to be addressed, <laughs> but, uh, but with their complicity with slavery, I would argue that really what they should do is form or contribute to a coalition that would uh, demand that Congress do the right thing. Uh, that that would be much more valuable than them setting up these $100,000 funds or $100 million funds and the like. And, and, and here's one of the major reasons. The magnitude of an expenditure of $14 trillion to eliminate the racial wealth gap is really only something that the federal government can do. And so let, let me illustrate with the following numbers. Mm -hmm. If generous donors, and this could include colleges and universities, corporations, or individuals, put $1 billion into a reparations fund on a monthly basis, so that would be $12 billion per annum, it would take a millennium to get to $14 trillion. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, it it seems like for some of these colleges, a hundred million dollars is the figure that they're really throwing out now, mm -hmm. and uh, that's so far removed from what would be required that uh, they shouldn't call it reparations. They can call it something <laughs> else, but they shouldn't call it reparations. Appreciate that context. It's it's interesting too because some of these colleges, the foundation of the college itself, like the survival you mentioned in your book too, of the college itself is founded on slavery. So yeah. it's like Yeah. 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 I mean Georgetown University is a prime example, but uh you know, the origins of the major universities in the United States, the most prestigious ones, are largely linked to the slave trade and, and slavery. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so let's be optimistic here, Dr. Darity. Let's imagine that everything that you're fighting for right now, all the research that you've been putting together, it all comes to, um, you know, something where the government does agree and we get that 60, 70, 80 percent of white people that say, like, you know what, this is what this is right. This is what should happen. And this and that. And the third. I'll um, take 45 percent, 45 percent, whatever. Yeah, I'll you take 45 percent. <laughs> yeah, that, that might do it. <laughs> um, and it does get passed. And. Uh, these measures go into place. What impact could you envision as far as the future um, will it have on the black uh, population in this country? Well, I think the thing that black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved here have been struggling to achieve is the conditions of full citizenship. And I think that a reparations project of this type would give the people the material conditions for full citizenship in the United States. And that is something that they, they've never had. Mm. And that's what I think would be truly transformative about a reparation plan. Got you. Got you. Um, so Dr. Darity, uh, I think you're doing great work, um, heavy duty work for us and, um, the entire black collective. Um, what is the legacy that you are trying to create? Because I think if this does go through, your name is definitely going to be on there as the names that really help this thing get to where it is and where where it became. So what is that legacy that, you know, you're trying to create with the work that you've done and, you know, everything you're doing? It's a legacy so much. Uh, yeah. Kirsten Mullen has a, a great phrase that she uses, and, and I think it's appropriate here. 
she talks about doing the work that you can leave as bread on the water. Mm. And so I hope that we are leaving bread on the water that will be useful to others so that they can swoop down and make use of it as the struggle continues. There it is. There it is. Uh, Dr. Darity, thank you so much for coming through. I know you are super duper busy, man. Thank you for your time coming on the program. Uh, if you could do us one last favor and leave us with your favorite quote and what it means to you, that would be greatly appreciated. Well, there's the, 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 the blues man, Otis Rush, used to say uh, in a song called Double Trouble, in this generation of millionaires, it's so hard to find decent clothes to wear. Mm. I want a world where everybody can have decent clothes to wear. Mm. Mm. Definitely something to ponder about. Appreciate that, Dr. Darity. Uh, you le you've left us with quite some gems today, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate your book. For listeners, please look into Dr. Darity's book, From Here to Equality. Um, it is definitely extensive. You've done a great deal of work and research and time put in to um to this movement man and i just want to say i appreciate your work i appreciate what you're doing i learned a, a ton looking into your work uh, your lectures and um your book man so i appreciate you man thank you thanks a lot for having me it's been a good conversation appreciate yes. it yes sir yes sir listeners definitely check out dr darity's book matter of fact we're giving away 10 free books all you got to do is send us an email mrg.mastermind that's with an E at the end at gmail.com and a subscription on our YouTube channel. So email and subscription, and we will send you a book, Dr. Darity's book. Um, so we're giving out first 10, first 10 that sends us an email. Um, and of course, remember, your mind is the most powerful tool in the universe. Therefore, if you can think it, you can do it. If you believe in it, you can be it. And if you fight for it, you can have it. The world is yours. This has been your host, Mr. G, and I'll see you next time. Oh, mastermind. Uh, so every day I'm going hard. I'm talking business, bank accounts, and credit cards. And somehow we defeat the odds and making sure that no one starves illegal or you had a job. And when they doubt him, brought the best out of me. The women want to holler, the fellas want to shout at me. The voices in my head, I swear they getting kind of loud of me. And how I turn this thing into gold, see this is alchemy. They never know. Never